Have you ever heard of the KISS principle, as in keep it simple stupid? Or the nicer version of it, as in keep it stupid simple? Azure Functions embodies that idea. Whether you're looking to go full out in microservices or just looking for a way to add a lot of power to your application with little effort, Azure Functions can help you out. They are quick to build, easy to maintain, and are powerful to operate. The best part is that while they run in Microsoft Azure, they're almost always free. In this video, we're going to look at how to build Azure Functions, how to deploy them, and walk through scenarios where you might use them. Before I proceed, I do want to point out that in the description, there are links to get my source code for this video, to sign up for my mailing list, to join Patreon, and to get access to my courses through my All Access Pass. Recently, I added the All Access Pass to my training content. For just $50 per month, you can gain access to over $1,000 of training resources, with more being added all the time. If you're serious about taking your career to the next level, that's a killer deal. Don't miss out. Now, if you haven't come across me before, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C Sharp easier. One of the ways I do that is by teaching context. There are a lot of tutorials out there that teach you what to do. I go a few steps beyond that to show you when to do it, why you should or should not do it, what pitfalls to avoid, and what the best practices are. Basically, I get you ready for the real world. If that's the type of training you're interested in, subscribe to my channel and hit the little bell icon to be notified when I release new videos. Okay, let's jump over to Visual Studio and we're gonna create a new project. And this new project is going to be an Azure function. So let me go to all project types and just search for function. So Azure functions, you have the little blue I'm out of minute. You have a little blue um, angle brackets and a yellow lightning bolt in the middle. Azure Functions. Okay. We hit next. We're going to give it a name. I'm going to call this function GitHub Monitor App. And the solution name is going to be Azure Function Demo. Okay. Now I'm going to create a function to show you what a function is. Because a lot of times it's easier to see it in, in action rather than just talking theory. So let's see it in the real world. Let's hit create. Now, once we get here, we have a number of options. All right, so it starts off at the very top with an empty Azure function. Notice a drop down here, it says Azure Functions v2.net core. You wanna be on v2 until v3 comes out and then move it to v3. Don't stay on version one. So if you have a v1 here, then, or you don't see a version number here, then make sure that you upgrade your Visual Studio to at least version two. As of the time it's recording, version three is out in pre-release mode, and I could go there, but I'm gonna stick with version two, the actual release mode, just to make sure we're fully compatible with everyone that's gonna try and work with this demo. Now, the move from version two to version three is a very, very simple one. It's not one that's gonna take a code change. So you don't have to worry about working on a version two app now and immediately having to upgrade. The upgrade will be pretty painless, okay? It's a couple of tweaks in the settings files. There's nothing to do in your actual code, all right? So version two is just fine. But then we have a number of options here. So let's talk about what an Azure function is from a very high level perspective. A function is an app that does one thing. That's its job, do one thing. Do one thing well, and that's it. If you're familiar with the idea of microservices, the concept of microservices is we have a bunch of different services or pieces out there that each do one thing and then pass off the work to another thing that does the next step along the process. And the, the benefit there is that by doing so, you can scale up one section. So let's say your, your order processing section is really getting hit hard. We well, can scale just that portion up without your entire app having to scale. Azure Functions are one way of doing that. The idea is it does one thing, and so that can be a really powerful tool in your toolbox. Now, maybe you're not gonna go to an Azure, or I'm sorry, to a microservices 
style architecture. You probably don't need to. Most companies aren't Amazon. Okay. So most companies don't need to have that massive scalability and that massive redundancy and all the rest. You probably have an application that just kind of putters along. You have, you know, anywhere from one to a hundred people in it at any one time. That doesn't necessarily need microservices. However, it really can benefit from Azure Functions. Because even though you don't need a scalability, what it also provides with Azure Functions is this idea where it's one thing. That's all it does. It's not complicated. It's pretty simple. And so the simple little thing doing one simple little task, you can kind of pull off and do that work outside of your main application. So if you have to add something, let's say you need to um, start emailing people. Well, instead of putting email stuff right in your main application, create an Azure function to do that. So let's look at how it can be triggered, and then we'll talk through um, what we're going to do today. So you can trigger this based upon a blob trigger. So what happens is a function gets run based upon a trigger. Something says run the function. Now, the trigger is something that it can be listening for. So in this case, a blob trigger means whenever you write a file to blob storage in Azure. Blob storage is very, very cheap, and it is basically just a dumping ground for files. So let's say you have, you know, people are uploading files to your website, and they upload their avatar. Their avatar is the picture of them. And they upload these massive files, you know, four, five, six megabyte files. And that's not web optimized. So when they upload that file, you'd probably store that file in, in blob storage. But then you could have a trigger off of that that would say, okay, run the Azure function. And the Azure function could take that file and create web-friendly versions of it. Maybe a, a small thumbnail version that's uh, 64 pixels by 64 pixels. And a little bit larger one that's 128 pixels by 128 pixels. And you have a few of those, and it saves those three or four or five files. So all you have to do is upload the file into blob storage, and the Azure function will trigger and take care of creating the, the other files for you. Done. All right? That's a really handy one. The next type is the Cosmos DB trigger. So if you're storing data in Cosmos DB, and that's a really powerful little database. I, I shouldn't say little. It's a little really powerful database that can be little, but it can really scale to massive sizes. But you can say, okay, whenever anybody modifies a document, I want you to trigger a function. So maybe you're watching for sign-up documents. Every time a person signs up, then you're going to trigger the function and it's going to send out an email to them saying, hey, welcome to, you know, welcome to the, the application. Okay. That could be a, a Cosmos DB trigger. There's a number of different triggers like the event grid. Event grid, event hub, and we're going to skip these next couple. Queue, service bus queue, service bus trigger. These are all triggers that happen when you say, okay, an event has happened. Whether it's an event or whether it's a queue message. Okay, a queue message. We're going to cover queues in a couple of videos from now. But queues are basically kind of like an email inbox, all right? So when I send an email to my wife, the email goes into her inbox, and it waits for her until she opens her inbox up and she reads the email and does something with it, okay? That's what a queue is. A queue is that email inbox. So one application sends a message and it puts it in the queue. And then this an Azure function could listen to that mailbox. And when a letter comes in, it could then read that letter and do something with it. You might see this in something like an order system. So a customer places an order on a website. That website might just put a item in a queue saying new order. And then this function might pick that up and create the work ticket to go get the items to pack into the boxes. Okay, or that might, and it also might put another letter afterwards, after it's created that work order, this function might put a queue item for the next function, which might pick that up and print out the label to ship it. Okay, and it can have all these series of items. 
The cool thing about cues is that they are disconnected and you don't have to be listening for them, okay? So what can happen is if you decide we need to do some work on our Azure function, you could take it down. And even though those orders are kind of piling up, the queue messages just keep sitting there. And then when you fix the Azure function and upload it, then it could process all those queue messages right then. So it's not like they have to be online at the same time. It could be a disconnected type thing. So queues and um, events can be pretty similar in that manner. So HTTP trigger, that's what we'll do today. This is whenever you see receive an HTTP request. This could be almost like the world's smallest API where it has just one endpoint. That's it. One, one URL to call and that's pretty much all it can do. Now you probably wouldn't want to give this to a user and say, okay, here's the, here's our endpoints. Only one we have, it only does one thing. That's probably not ideal. Typically it's more for computer to computer. I'm not sure if you ever heard of the idea or concept of web hooks, but web hooks are things that can be triggered from applications and then they can call out to a web URL. So for example, in today's demo, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up a web hook from GitHub. So whenever I post a, or create a commit in GitHub, I want it to trigger this my Azure function. And then what I can do is I can process the commit message if I wanted to. I could have it then send me a text and say, hey, someone just, um, someone just pushed a commit to your repository. Okay, there's a lot of things I can do with those web, web hooks. A lot of web applications offer web hooks. So Azure DevOps and GitHub, they offer web hooks, but others do too. So uh, for example, Slack, if you use Slack, you could actually capture a web hook from there and it could trigger some kind of web functionality for you. There's a lot of different companies and processes that do that. It allows you to connect to a system that you have no control over and get information out of it. So pretty powerful stuff. IoT. So if you're working with the Internet of Things, which basically little devices usually um, that are on the edge of networks, they can trigger events or trigger Azure functions. So maybe you capture whenever a temperature change is posted, you could capture that and store it in a database. Okay. Pretty powerful stuff there as well. All right. Then there's a timer trigger. So maybe you just have a job that needs to be run every X number of minutes, hours, or days, something like that. You could create a timer trigger and have this run. All right. And notice here, if you're familiar with the, I believe it's cron uh, settings for how the um, hours, minutes, and seconds are designated, you can create that pattern. Right now that's five minutes. So every five minutes this trigger will run. All right, so I imagine you have a lot of questions. Let's actually get to see one of these HTTP triggers because they're all very, very similar. It's just the difference is how they're triggered pretty much. Okay, so here we're going to use a storage account of storage emulator. So a lot of Azure functions will need storage. And the reason why is because they'll store some information about the trigger or about the uh, Azure function or capture information from uh, storage or send stuff to storage and things like that. The good news is storage is very, very, very cheap and you only pay for what you use. So locally, I'll use a storage emulator. However, when I push this to Azure, I will need to have a storage account and that's not a problem, we'll create one and we'll go over the pricing at that point. I've got the pricing calculator up and we'll see that um, we'll pay pennies even if we use this a lot, okay? And just to be clear, again, I'll cover this more in depth but you can trigger up to a million Azure function calls a month for free. Okay. A million. So don't think of this as, you know, just the entry level is free. You can pretty much use this in production unless you're really heavily hitting it um, and pay nothing for it. So 
Azure Functions can be something where you can make it your application really, really powerful for not much money at all, okay? So the other thing we have here is authorization level. We have three options, and we'll see how it changes in the code, but the default is function. So we have admin, we have anonymous, and we have function. These are three different levels of security for our Azure function. We're going to use a HTTP trigger. That's why we have this authorization level. So since anyone can call this our URL, we want to know, do you want to have security on it or not? In our case, yeah, we do want to have security on it because we don't want just anyone to call our endpoint. What if a bot or a crawler on the web got hold of it and next thing you know, we have somebody you know, paying it just for fun and saying it's bad data and it's going to be put in the database or something else. Not ideal. So we're going to put security on this. But this is basically computer-to-computer -computer interactions. These are not typically user-to-Azure function interactions. Therefore, we don't have a sign-in page. We don't have a place to, you know, create a login, all the rest. So we're going to get a key to use to talk to our Azure function. And we'll see that once we deploy it. Okay, so we're going to use function level security. Admin level security is a higher level, but it really is just another key. Okay, and anonymous is like it sounds like anyone can access our Azure function if they have the URL. So let's hit create. And this will create our Azure function for us. And it's called function one, which is a horrible name. So let's rename this. So I'm going to right click and rename and call this GitHub Monitor. Okay, and yes, I want to rename all the references. So now the class is GitHub Monitor as well. Notice that the function name is still function one. That's just a string. We do want to change that. Let's make it match. So GitHub Monitor. Okay, so this is the function name that we'll be using in places like um, Azure. So once we actually deploy it to Azure, we'll be using this GitHub monitor name. So you do want to name it something great, not function one. That's not ideal. Now, Azure uses decorators in order to identify what's going to happen. So right here, this tells you a lot about what type of function this is. It's an HTTP trigger. Okay, so we chose that HTTP trigger earlier. Well, that's indicated here, and it has that authorization level, which is function. Notice we can do control J here and choose other options. We're going to leave it at function. Then we have get and post. What does it sound like? Well, it sounds like these are the ways we can access our URL. And yes, that is true. We have a get and a post. We can do either one. We're going to leave that for now, but we will change that before we publish to Azure, because we don't want to have um, a get call. Remember that if you have a get call and you pass data, it's going to come across as a URL parameter, and that might not be ideal for certain circumstances. Now, if you don't want to support one, which you won't in a minute, we can just delete that right there, and now we only do the support post, not get. But we'll leave it on, like I said, for now. The route. So by default, what it's going to be is the route is the URL that, that we have in Azure slash API slash our function name. So in our case, it would be our URL slash API slash GitHub monitor. That'd be our route. If you wanted to change that, you could change it right here. We're not going to. Okay. Now, all of this then indicates, okay, we have an HTTP request pass it into that. So that's the full HTTP request of our Azure function. And then finally, we do have an iLogger, which should look familiar if you're familiar with .NET Core projects. We have the ability to log to our app. And by default, it's the built-in logging from Microsoft, which does include the ability to log to application insights. I'm not going to go too far into that in this demo. That's a whole other subject. But... Um, you can turn application insights on and listen to your logging right out of the box. Okay, so the first thing that happens is it has a log information. 
and it's a C-sharp HTTP trigger function, process a request. Let's change that to um, our GitHub monitor process a pull or a, a push. Let's call it a, um, an action. It sounds better. Um, we're going to monitor just push actions, but let's just say an action. Okay. We're going to get rid of this for now. That's reading the query string name. Um, now, you know what? I'm going to leave it for just for demo purposes for now, because right now what's happening is it's going to grab the name parameter off the query and we can do a git and put that name parameter on. And then it's going to say hello and my name in the return. Okay. So kind of cool. You can do something like that. Um, and that's just going to be a demo for us. And then we're going to get into actually using this in the real world. So we'll kind of change this up a bit. So let's leave it right here. And then we're going to um, just run it. Now you may think, well, if this is a Azure function, that sounds an awful lot like you have to run it in Azure. And the answer is yes and no. You, you do have to run it in Azure when, you, well, mostly you have to run it in Azure when you are in production. You can deploy it as a container. And I believe you can deploy it to then to any container service, not just Azure. But um, it really works well with Azure. And it's really, like I said, almost free, if not free. Um, but in development uh, land, you don't want to do that. You don't want to deploy to Azure just to test it out. So how do you do that? Well, the really cool thing is this is actually going to be a console application, or pretty close to a console application. It's going to run Kestrel and then give you a URL. Okay, so let's launch this. And we'll watch it launch into our application. Okay, so here we go. So it's a, a console style application. It's going to say, hey, we blocked some of the functionality of the private network. Do you want to allow it? Yes, go ahead and allow that. Um, so here we go. So this is all the setup. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep triggering. It's, gonna, it's listening. I'm going to mouse to the top, though. Um, so I started this, it's got a cool little graphic here, uh, ASCII graphic, kind of neat. And it talks through all the things it's doing. And down here at the very bottom, it says, we're monitoring Git and post on this URL. Notice there's my main URL slash API slash GitHub monitor. Okay, so I'm going to copy that. And now I'm going to do, I'm going to come over here to my browser. We're going to open up a new URL. We're going to paste it in and go, well, we're just going to paste it. And then I'm going to say question mark user equals Tim. Remember it says going to look for, let's pull it down. Um, it was going to look for the query of, oh, it's name, not user. So let's fix that. Name equals Tim. All right. So let's hit enter. And it says, that's kind of small but it says, hello, Tim. All right. And if we look over here, we'll see that we have a, a request that came in. We have a get on this URL. We executed it, it succeeded, and it processed it through with a 200 request. And we don't have a favicon, so therefore it had a 404 on that. No big deal. Okay. So that's how I can test it locally. It's just, it gives us that URL, you can point to it, and you can go from there. You can use your browser, you can use uh, something like Postman or something else. And you may have noticed that we don't have, let's move this off the screen. Actually, let's just minimize it. Uh, we don't have any kind of security. And I said there was security at the function level. In fact, right here it says authorization level of function. Even if I change it to admin and run this locally, I don't need any kind of security. And the reason why is because trying to use security in dev is a pain. And Microsoft said, yeah, we hear that. So let's say that whenever you're running inside of your um, Visual Studio environment in development, 
then we're not going to ask you for that, those permissions. Okay. So you don't have to test your permissions locally. Cool. You can just run it. All right. Now, right now what we did, we pulled off the query uh, from the request. So the request as the HTTP request, we pulled did a query off of the query parameters and said, look for the name parameter and put that to a string. Okay. So that's what we're doing right now, but we don't want to do that in the real world, right? We probably want to do a post only. So let's get rid of our get. And we don't want to read out the query parameter because you know, that's not secure information. So let's get rid of that. We'll get rid of this as well. And let's look at what we have left. Now what we have left is this request body, which is await new stream reader request dot body read to end async. What that's doing is it's reading the request body, which kind of makes sense since it says request dot body also known as request body. Okay. Um, and read to end, but naming is great, isn't it? When you have good naming, then it's kind of easy to understand. Oh, the request body, we're going to read the request body and read to end. Okay. So basically read the whole body. Okay. Now the body of your request is where you'll have things like JSON data. So if you're going to post a bunch of data to this as a post request, you're going to send the data in the body. Okay. So therefore we're going to read that whole thing as a string, but if we're going to post JSON data, then we can use JSON convert, which JSON convert is the replacement for, um, Newton soft JSON. Oh, I'm sorry. It still is Newton soft JSON. They are replacing that. Let's put it that way. Um, so it will be Microsoft built in JSON converter, but for right now it's JSON convert. Uh, and deserializes the object. Okay. So what this does, it takes the body and it deserializes it into an object. Now, right now we're just saying deserialize it into a dynamic object. Meaning when you have properties and they have values, create properties in data and assign the value to that property. Okay. So let's just look at a little bit of JSON down here. So if I had something that looks like this, and I said first name colon Tim like this and last name colon Corey and then close curly braces. This is valid JSON. Now what it's going to do when it assigns it to data is it's going to say, okay, then data dot first name equals Tim. Okay. And data dot last name equals Corey, like so. And now we can access data dot first name and data dot last name. Now the tricky part is dynamic will allow for any types of properties and arrays and all the rest, but you have to know what they are ahead of time because otherwise you got to kind of search through it and it's not the greatest. However, you can deserialize this object. Notice when I put a angle bracket, you can say I type T. So if I had person model, I could say that request body should be a person model and put that into a person model and call it var instead. And now data would be a person model, not just dynamic. Okay. Now I don't have person model. I'm not going to get person model. Therefore that wouldn't be ideal. Okay. So that's how dynamic works with a deserialization. Now, right here, we're returning the name. If, or if not null, we're going to return an okay object that says hello, otherwise a bad request object, but let's do this instead. Since we're not going to capture any data, we're not going to worry about it. Um, instead we're going to do is we're going to do a, uh, a log dot log information on the data itself, just log the whole thing. Actually log the request body. That's where I'll log. And then we're going to just return a okay object like so return. Okay. Object or okay. Result. Okay. 
and we have to say new. I might have to cast this to an action result. I don't have to, okay. So we say new okay result. A new okay result just means we're gonna return 200 saying that, yep, that worked and that's it. Now, this is not what you do in a real, app, real Azure function because you would wanna do something with your data. I'm not gonna do anything with my data because that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. But this might be where you log this into, let's say, SQL Server. So this function is going to get triggered whenever anyone does a push of new code into my GitHub repository. It's going to trigger that and say, okay, call this Azure function. And this Azure function is going to fire and it's going to do something. Maybe I write that out to SQL with some information. Maybe uh, who did it and what the commit message was, okay? So in that case, I'd have my SQL logging right here. And as long as I, I don't have any failure issues, that is return an okay result. If you wanted to, you could return back an okay result object that had some data in it, um, maybe the, um, the title of the message so you know which, which commit it was, but really okay result as long as you don't crash is probably just fine. Okay, but this is where you do the actual work. Okay, um, you know, so something like this where you'd say to do, do something with the data. All right, and again, that's outside the scope of this video, but that's what you do is right there, do the work. Okay, so let's get this set up for Azure. We wanna actually see this in action, okay? So let's go over to Azure. We can close out of this. And we're gonna set up a new Azure sur um, Azure storage. I'm gonna do it ahead of time. I could do it right when I needed it, but I wanna set it up right now. So create resource and say storage account. And I'm gonna select a new resource group and we'll call this Azure function demos. Hit okay. A resource group, like I said before, is just a name. There's no cost associated, it's just a grouping. And I group like things together so that when I wanna get rid of those things, I can get rid of all of them by deleting the resource group. Okay, storage account name, um, testDB. That's one of the ones I've, I've been using for. Um, but you have to have a all lowercase, I believe. And so let's choose um, Azure Function Storage. Okay, and it's already taken. It. Um, so, Timco Azure Function Storage, um, between three and 24 characters, looks like I'm too long. So, Timco Function Storage, there we go. So, it's Timco Function Storage is my storage account name. I'm gonna put this in East US 2. Performance is standard, storage is V2, and it is um, local redundant storage is fine, okay? And it is a hot tier. And you may ask, okay, Tim, you just bring up a whole bunch of things I have no clue about. What is storage V2? What is local redundant storage? And what is hot versus cool? Well, hot versus cool is probably semi self-explanatory. Cool is where the data is not accessible very fast. And the reason why you might choose that is for, let's say backups. You don't need to access your backups all the time and have them immediately accessible as in within half a second or a millisecond. You just need them accessible when you need backups, okay? So therefore you might store it in the cool storage, which is cheaper. Replication, we're only gonna do locally redundant storage, meaning we don't need to go zone or geo redundant storage. What that would be is if Let's say geo redundant storage, I might have a storage here in the East US too, and another one in Europe. And I could, I could make sure they're redundant, meaning it synchronizes the storage between the two in case one were to go down. I don't need that. And V2 versus storage or V1 and blob storage. The recommendation is V2 because it has more features and has some tiers that you can work with. Now. You may say, okay, that sounds expensive. You know, uh, storage, local redundancy, and hot tier. Let's look at the pricing calculator. 
So if you're not familiar, you can just Google. And it's, that's what I do. I don't even know the URL, but it's uh, Azure Pricing Calculator. Google that and you'll get the first one is azure.microsoft.com slash pricing slash calculator. Click on that. And what you do is you pick the products that you want to use. Now, I've already chosen two. I've chosen Azure Functions and Storage. And then what you do is once you've picked all the products you're going to use, and you can delete them to get rid of them, then you come down here and you play with things. So this is East US. I should choose East US 2. The region probably won't matter except for large region jumps. So, for example, East US versus East US 2 versus Central US versus West US, those won't have a pricing difference most likely. However, if I chose a region that's well away from my country, okay? So if I chose um, Norway East, that might have a different pricing than what I have in the US. But pretty much the US will have the same pricing. Um, I think that Europe pretty much has the same pricing as each other. And Asia... East Asia, Southeast Asia, those probably have the same pricing with each other. So it's pretty much in a region you'll have the same pricing. You might have a little bit different. So keep an eye on that, but you really want to put your, your region as close as possible to where you are. All right. So type is block blob storage is fine. Performance tier is standard. So as my first option was standard versus premium, I chose standard. General purpose V2, sounds familiar. That's what I chose. LRS, local redundant storage, that's what I chose, and hot tier. Okay, now, with storage accounts, you pay for what you use. So I have chosen to say, I'll be using one gigabyte of storage. I'll be doing 10,000 write operations, 10,000 list and create container operations, and 10,000 read operations. Now, that's a ridiculous number of operations. It's all per month. Okay. But note that pricing here. With all of that, I have a total of 12 cents per month. Now, if I were to say, you know what? Let's only do a thousand lists and creates and a thousand writes and leave, leave the read operations at 10,000. Now I'm down to three cents per month. Okay. This is not an expensive thing, especially if you're not using it to any scale, but even if you are, so let's go back up here and let's just say we have one terabyte of storage. So 1000 gigabytes of storage, and let's bump these up to a million each. All right. A million reads, a million writes, um, and a million list and create containers. And I'm down here at $19.80 a month. So a terabyte of storage and a million operations each way, read and write. And I'm still only at $19.80 a month. That is not expensive. Not at all. Okay. So storage is very, very cheap. And you're paying just for what you need what you use. So it's not like I'm saying I'm reserving a terabyte. That would be if I actually had a terabyte of storage used. So if I only have half a terabyte of storage used. Let's just say that I plan to have a terabyte. But I only have half so far. Now my bill is down to $10 and 60 cents a month with everything else being the same. So it's just pay for what you use. So you're probably, probably going to use, especially in testing, but even in operation, you first start using it, you'll probably use a penny or two a month if you're using storage. Now, even though Azure Functions needs storage, sometimes it doesn't really use it at all. It may use a couple of kilobytes of storage, and that's it. At that point, you're pretty much using $0. Okay, let's talk functions while we're here. So an Azure function in the East US, your first 400,000 gigabytes per second of execution. Yes, you're reading that right. 400,000 gigabytes per second of execution. 
and 1 million executions are free. Absolutely free. So if I decide to go to 10 million operations, so that's 10 million executions, that's $1.80 per month. So Azure Functions is incredibly cheap. Okay, some people use this to run their blog or to, um, you know, do things like that where they've changed to having Azure Storage as their blog host for like their files, and then Azure Functions to trigger certain things for displaying their blog. By doing so, you can run even a pretty popular blog for pennies a month. Okay, may it's not ideal, may it's not the the um, the best solution for a blog, but at the same time it shows that it can be a really, really powerful solution for cheap or in most cases, free. Okay, so that is the pricing calculator. Try it out. Just note that if you come back in later and you wanna say, you know, say look at Azure SQL Database, you click on it, it's here, but notice you still have your Azure Functions and you still have your Azure Storage. So just know you have to go up here and delete it if you didn't want it anymore for the next calculation. So in this case, hey, I'm, I've got a $1,400 SQL Server. Let's not do that. Don't worry, SQL is not nearly that expensive. Um, single database, and you go with uh, DTU basic, and now you're down to uh, $4.90 per month. So not expensive at all. Just so you know, and this is a total side track, but if you're using SQL in the cloud in a production, look into the Elastic Pool. And the idea here is that you share this pool of resources and you can put as many databases in there as you want for the same fee. So in this case, your entire pool costs $147 with essentially unlimited databases. Now there is a limitation to it. It's more of a practical limitation than anything else, but what you're paying for is these DTUs the amount of processing you use per hour. So, okay, so the limitation here is 200 databases. That's the max you can do for 20 cents an hour. If you wanna step down to 50 DTUs, that's only $73 a month, and you can have up to 100 databases using those DTUs, and they share them. So uh, when one needs the resources and the others don't, no big deal, the one takes the resources and then gives them back for when the other ones need the resources. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a shared pool, but it's shared with yourself. That's it. All right, little tangent, but I wanted to show that off real quick. So delete this and you delete out that um, item from your, your pricing list. Notice down here the estimated monthly cost is $10.60 based upon our current configuration. I could save this, I could export it to Excel. I could even share that um, with somebody else. So. With all that being said, we've proven that Azure Functions are basically free and storage is as well. Storage does have a cost associated with it, but it's, for our cases, it's gonna be zero or a penny a month type of thing. So we now have, come back to our storage here and we see that we have our name, we have our location, standard performance, V2, local redundant storage. Notice there's the acronym there, LRS. So you're not sure the acronyms are? Well, ZRS, GRS, they show they are based upon in parens, but they give you the user-friendly name of local redundant storage here. And of course, hot tier. We'll review and create this. And this is going to set this all up for us. We hit create. And this will create a storage account for us in uh, probably 30 seconds to a minute. Not bad. Okay. So now that we've got this going, let's go ahead and go back to Visual Studio. And I am going to get ready to publish this out to Visual Studio. So I have my GitHub monitor function. I can right click on the project and say publish. Now, eventually you want to put this into Azure DevOps and have a a CI CD process where you publish it automatically and it gets built and, and sent to a slot and all the rest. But for testing purposes and getting started and even for low level uh, work, 
you can just do right click publish. I would not recommend it for long term production, but short term, it works just fine. So we're going to use the Azure function consumption plan. The consumption plan is different than the premium plan in that the consumption plan scales dynamically. Okay, that's really, really helpful, but it's also really, really cheap. Now, if you want to pay for it, you can go to the premium plan. The premium plan has faster workers, no cold starts, and advanced networking. A cold start means the first time you call a function, it might be a little slow. And we'll see that when we call it the first time. It's going to take a couple of seconds to run because of the fact that it's starting up, spooling up. If we go back to our Azure pricing calculator and look down at Azure functions, we can choose to look for a um, the advanced. Oh, I don't see it on here. So let's go to pricing details. And here we can look at the pricing details and look for our premium plan. So it looks like for uh, vCPU, vCPU duration, which is a virtual CPU duration and memory duration, we're looking at $116 per virtual CPU per month and $8 per gigabyte per month of memory. So a little more expensive, a lot more expensive, but it can be more uh, powerful for you. So that they have a consumption plan. They don't have a good calculator for the premium plan because that's a newer thing they just brought out. But this can be really powerful for businesses that want to go to the next level. So let's go back over here. Oh, we already have deployed. So let's pin that to the dashboard and we'll go to the resource. And there's our storage container. Woohoo. Not much to it. Containers, file share, tables, and queues. Remember I said that um, Azure Functions can trigger off queues? Well, you can actually put a queue right in your storage. And this could be a really simple, that, that email inbox kind of thing, where you can put messages in here and then have your functions trigger based upon those messages or based upon files in your containers. Let's minimize this. And we're going to choose an Azure function consumption plan. We're going to create a new Azure function consumption plan. Now you can put multiple functions inside of one plan. And that can be helpful for seeing them operate together or um, managing them. You can also deploy a function as an app service. So web app essentially, only it gets deployed um, as a, it's a function but it's deployed as a web app. Same thing with Linux, or you can even put it in a folder because this is going to create a zip file for us. Run from package file. So we're actually going to run it from that zip file. Now in our case, we're going to run it from package file, which is recommended, and we're going to create a new one. So create profile. And we're going to say, okay, our name is going to be, let's call it GitHub Monitor app, not that long URL at the end or number at the end. Yes, my Visual Studio Enterprise account. Yes, in um, let's let's change this. I have an Azure Function Demos um, resource group, it looks like. So, oh, that's the one I just created. Cool. So that's the one I just created. Therefore, that's where I choose. And location, not Northern Europe. I'm not sure why it said that. We want East US too. Which the resource group is an ESUS2, and so it didn't recommend ECUS2 as a location. Not sure why. Storage. I have Azure Storage for Lead Magnet for Timco Function Storage. There we go. That's the one I want. So that's the one I just created. And I could create additional resources. I could create a storage account right here or a SQL database if I needed those. But I don't need those. I've selected the ones I already have. So this uh, window allows you to create everything you need, even if you don't pre-create anything. Now, I created my storage ahead of time. One of the things I found it is with the templates for version 2, I believe, it still creates a version 1 storage account. Remember I said the recommendation is a version 2 storage account? Well, that's what I created. Therefore, it will use that. It's just if it creates it on its own, it creates a version one, not sure why. And it may have been my configuration issues. I, I may have messed something up, but by creating ahead of time, I know for certain what it's gonna be. So with this filled out, 
I hit create. It's going to create my plan, my Azure function plan. And then it's going to allow me to deploy this Azure function to that plan. Okay, so I just finished up. Now I did pause the video for a little bit to let it run because that can take a few minutes and there's no reason for you to stare at a spinning dial. But now it's created, you're not done yet. You've created the, the um, Azure Function app or the Azure Function container, but not the actual app itself. That's where this publish button comes into play. So you set it all up, you're ready to publish, just hit publish. And what that will do is it will push your function using a zip deploy. It will push this out to Azure. And this shouldn't take too long. Because all it's going to do is zip your application up, which your application, if you noticed, it's one CS file essentially. You have a host.json, a local settings.json, and a git ignore, and that's kind of it. I mean, that, that's not really a whole lot of application to publish. And that's all it's really doing. So now it's done. Let's go over to our dashboard. I did pin this to the dashboard, the function app. You can find it under all resources. You can look for the GitHub monitor app that you created. You click on it, and this is the, the whole container right here. Notice you can have multiple functions under here. So we, we just have one, but and it's refreshing right now. It's gonna take a little bit to refresh and show us the function. This can be a little bit slow sometimes. And here's our GitHub monitor. So now we have this GitHub monitor. This is all set. And it says this function is in read only mode because you're running from a package file. That's that zip file. To make changes, update the content of your zip file and website run from package app setting. Okay, these are things you don't need to worry about because it's going to be put into our zip file for us. We just need to know that it will run from that zip file. Now we're gonna get the function URL in just a minute. But let's look through the other options here. Integrate, right now, um, it's only integrated with our storage. Manage, this is where you can actually get the function key and the master key. Remember I said that we are choosing to do a function level security? Well, here is the key that you could copy for that URL. So when we call that URL, we're gonna need to know this key, which there is the key right there, woohoo. Now, yes, you could copy that and real quickly and, and grab it, but I'm gonna delete the function before this video goes out, so no big deal. But that's what you're gonna copy, this whole string right here, which is really helpful because you just hit copy and it's now on the clipboard. Okay, so let's hide that and monitor. This is where we see where this is called and we could configure application insights. I'm just gonna show you how to do this just by hitting configure. And what it's gonna do is gonna create an application insight using the um, new resource name is fine of GitHub monitor app and okay. Application Insights gives you insights into your application. You got it. So this is a little bit better monitoring and um, it's a really, really powerful tool inside of Azure that can give you a lot of information about what's going on in your running applications. So again, like I said, this is outside of the scope of this video to explain in depth about Application Insights, but just know that it is pretty powerful. It is something to learn about. It is something I will be teaching on in the future. So it is coming, it's just not quite yet. Okay, so let's go back to our monitoring app and we can hit refresh on this. And it's having a problem with the application insights right now. Um, shouldn't be a problem though, it should be that it refreshes. There we go. And so now this is the normal view for your monitoring and you can click to run this view in Application Insights to get more information. Now note in this view, results may be delayed for up to five minutes. I've never seen it delayed five minutes, but it can be a little delayed in your results. So if you don't see something pop up right away, just know that it may be just that delay in getting a log out to the screen. Let's come back up to our function itself and we're going to 
There's a link over here. There's going to be a link over here. It says get function URL. Click on that and hit copy. What is this? Well, notice, first of all, it's a URL, GitHub Monitor app .azure -websites .net slash API slash GitHub Monitor. Sound familiar? The API slash GitHub Monitor is what I said would, was going to be the, the path for our, our function. But then you have the question mark code equals and this long thing that ends on two double equals or two equals. Um, that's our code. That's the uh, function level security. So by copying this entire URL, I now have the function key along with the URL. So I can just give this to any webhook environment and say, here is the security as well as the um, URL to call. It makes it very easy to set up these webhooks and still have some security on them. Now, this is not high-end, top-of-the-line security in the fact that if someone were to look through the logs and find that URL, they could then call your Azure function. However, the security is, doesn't have to be that high level because of the fact that we're talking about just preventing people from calling it to keep junk calls off the line. If someone really wants to be malicious, then you'd go to the next level of not allowing those calls without that secret being hidden. And so you'd have to make sure that your webhooks hid that secret before they call it, basically put in the post, not in the, uh, the URL, okay? So just know that that is something you can kind of up the security on if you needed to, but 99.999% of you won't need to do that. So now we have that URL, let's actually get something to trigger that URL. Let's go over to, this is my GitHub page. And I have the long for net tutorial I have on YouTube has a GitHub page. It's got some information in here, including a solution and some scripts and so on. But I noticed down here that this URL is out of date. This is now uh, signup.imtimcorey.com. So let's make a modification to this. Before I do, I wanna put, I wanna put a web hook on this so whenever a push is made to my repository with a new commit, I want to trigger my webhook. So let's go over to settings. And in settings for GitHub, we see webhooks. Click on that. And I want to say add webhook. And it says payload URL. What's the URL to call? Well, I'm going to call that URL as copy and paste it in. Notice it's an HTTPS call. Content type. I don't want form encoded. I want to have application slash JSON. That's what I'm decoding from is application.json. I'm not going to use a secret box. I am going to use SSL verification. And which events would you like to trigger the webhook? Well, it could be a push event or let me select individual events. You can come down here and say, oh, well, yeah, I want pushes, but I also want stars. All right, so if someone stars your repository, you can actually have a something um, trigger that to, let's say, text you or email you. Um, that's a little much. Hopefully, you will get to the point where you're, you have more stars and then it would be wise to have it texting you every time. But you could do that. But pushes is fine. So I'm going to just, uh, whenever a, the push event, that's the most common one. And yes, we will deliver an event detail when the hook is triggered. So add webhook. That's all there is to it. I now have a web webhook. Notice it's got the gray icon saying it's never been triggered. Let's go back to the log for net tutorial. This is one of the nice features about um, GitHub. Is this little pencil icon here? I can make a modification in line in this readme file and then commit those changes. So this URL right here is HTTPS signup.imtimcorey.com. And let's copy that and paste it over here. This is Markdown, by the way. And so now if I commit this, let's give it a quick message updated signup URL 
fixed the mailing list URL to be the current signup page. And yes, that is a valid signup page now. And it says, who's committing? Well, I am. And then commit directly to the master branch. Yep, that's fine. We hit commit changes. So this is going to make a commit to my repository, which should trigger the webhook. Now, let's go back over here real quick and notice that, yes, we have this running. And yes, we are monitoring it. It is set up. We have pushed it. We're all good to go. So let's hit commit changes. It has been committed. Let's go back over to settings. Go to webhooks. And notice a green check mark here. If we click on the URL, come down here, it says recent deliveries. Yep, that worked. If you click on it, it's going to give you information about the request, what was sent over. Here you can see the payload. Notice these are all the properties you could pull from. And then here's the response. The response was a 200 message, meaning success. And there was no body in that, in that success message. So we, we've triggered the, the Azure function, and it seems to have worked to give us a 200 message back. Let's go over to our monitoring app, and let's hit refresh. And refresh again. It may take a minute to um, get this to show up, but we should see that we have a successful event in a couple of seconds. All right. And there we go. It took about a minute to come in. So now we have our successful message. We have a 200 message. It took 307 milliseconds. That's that cold start. So that's that first one. If we click on this, we should see more information about it, including the executing, when it was executed, our GitHub monitor process and action. Sound familiar? That's our log statement. Then here's another log statement. Here's all the information that that gave us in string form. And then here's when it succeeded. So with this information, we could cap, we could actually just control A and control C to copy this and then go into Visual Studio. Let's do that actually. Go to Visual Studio and let's come down here um, at the end. I'm going to say file actually edit, and it's going to be paste special, paste JSON as classes. And there's a sender. There's the owner. There's the repository. There's the last response, the config class, the hook, and you'll see this root object here. So this is all the information about that GitHub uh, message. So I could copy this and come up here and say deserialize object as a root object. Now root object is not a great name, but that's the name that it gives when you paste it in. And we could say, instead of dynamic, we could say var here. And now this will capture all this information in these property names. Okay, so whenever you make a call, whenever the, uh, the hook gets triggered, and it triggers our Azure function, we can capture all this information. Maybe we want to know information about the sender. Maybe we want to know uh, who sent, who uh, did something. So we can capture that information. Let's come down here to sender. For example, the Gravatar ID or the, gra the avatar URL. Here's the URL for their image. So you can grab that image and then display it on a dashboard somewhere and say, hey, this person just posted. You could get information about their followers. So you follow up on that by using that URL. There's a lot of information you gather out of this webhook. Now this is just one example of one company and how they do webhooks. A lot of companies do webhooks both ways. Have you ever heard of If This Then That? That tool uses webhooks and it can also be a webhook. I mean, it can, it can generate and it can call your Azure function. So you can have something else trigger an if this then that message that then triggers your Azure function. The possibility here with just these HTTP triggers are almost endless. But then there's all these other types of triggers as well. 
with a blob storage and the Cosmos DB and a timer and all different cues and events you can listen to. Azure Functions is really, really powerful. It's got a ton of possibilities. And one of the things it can do really well is it can offload pieces of your application and make them on their own. They're separate. They're single responsibility principle. Ever heard of the solid principles and single responsibility, the first one? That's what an Azure function is. It's got one responsibility. It does one thing and does it well. Now, when it comes to managing, when it comes to uh, keeping this thing up and running and making sure the code is right, that's all the code I have. Now, yes, I'm not actually doing anything. But what if I'm writing this a SQL? Then I'm going to have about one more line of code here that says, save that object to SQL. Especially if I'm using like a, a NoSQL database, in which case it really is one line. Maybe with, um, with SQL, I have to break this apart into different tables. In which case, not a big deal. I just grab each object and save it to its own table. So maybe I have 30 lines of code, let's just say. Well, I'm managing 30 lines of code for the entire application. Three, zero lines. That's not a big deal. So having this where you have, this is our emailing function. Whenever anybody sends a queue message to send an email, it pulls the information out and sends that email. It's doing one thing. And yet it's a really powerful thing and you don't have to make your application more complex. You can actually make it simpler in some ways. On the other side of things, if you have a thousand Azure functions, that might make for a complex environment. So you do have to make a, a choice here as to when it's better to do one monolithic application and when it's right to break it apart into pieces. My encouragement to you is to find a balance. Don't just stick to one side or the other. Find the balance that works for you. But Azure Function is a great tool to have in the toolbox. And as you've seen, it's really, really, really inexpensive. So it can be used in production. Those weren't just development numbers. Those are production numbers. So it can be used in production for pennies a month if you're using storage a lot. And if you're not using storage, then it is free for up to a million calls a month. So a lot you can do with it. So try it out. Try out the different types. Maybe think of through uh, one or two things that you might be able to make your application do better with an Azure function. Now, when you're first starting out, you may not think of a reason to even use an Azure function. What I would do is create something simple like this webhook. Create a webhook maybe to um, Azure DevOps or to GitHub. And even if you do just recreate what I did and just have it write the information out to SQL, that's all you do. Have it right where I have this highlighted line, have it right out to SQL. If you do that and try it out, then you'll get your feet wet in Azure Functions. I always encourage people, try out what you learn. Just watching me do it can be just entertainment. You want to learn, you want to grow, you want to be better. Therefore, try it out and play with it. As you do, think through your application. Don't try and fit a function to your application. Find out where in your application you need help and see if a function is the right choice for it. But doing so, think through, how can I make this better? How can I make this more disconnected? How can I take this chunk out and make it a single responsibility? All right. Now, in the comments, I love for those of you who have used Azure Functions or who have some ideas for Azure Functions, help others out. Like I said, it's hard sometimes when you're first starting out to think of ideas. Now, don't go super complex here because an Azure Function should not be super complex. But help others out by posting your ideas for what you might want to use an Azure Function for. Whether it's, like I said, converting images or processing files that have been uploaded or creating files to download or all these other things you could do with it, post those down in the comments. And then if you're wondering what should I do in Azure Function, read the comments and maybe get some ideas of what to do for testing or to try out or even do in production. Now, this is not the only video I'm going to do on Azure Functions. I really love Azure Functions. 
There's some, a really powerful tool and a really great tool to be using. So we'll be using these more in the upcoming months. So don't think this is a, a one and done kind of thing. We're definitely going to keep going in Azure Functions. There's so much more to cover. I just barely scratched the surface in this video. So keep looking out for that. In the meantime, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.